Hey everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Uh, I'm not in the usual studio, I'm in Antarctica. I'm filming this uh, in advance. Now, this isn't related to Antarctica or the Flat Earth, this is about the moon landings. Uh, one argument that I regularly see from people is how are the astronauts able to take perfectly composed pictures given that they're in a spacesuit, that the camera's strapped to the chest, that they've got big gloves on, etc. So, I'm going to replicate it. I'm in Antarctica anyway, I've got all this gear, so I've got one, two, three layers of gloves that I'm going to put on, and a big ski mask that is going to stick so far out that when I look down I can barely see my own chest. And then I'm going to walk around with my camera set to 35 millimeters, which is the same equivalent focal length that was used on Apollo. And I'm going to hold it with one hand against my chest, and with the other hand, I'm going to press the shutter release button to take photos. And I'm basically going to put it to the test of can I compose some decent photos with not actually being able to see what I'm doing. So let's head outside and find out. Hello from present day me. Yes, I filmed that back in December whilst I was in Antarctica, and we'll get onto the rest of the test in a moment, but first, a little backstory to the set the scene. I filmed this because I'd heard many people over the years claiming that the Apollo photographs couldn't have been taken by astronauts on the moon because the photos look too professional, and so therefore they must have been shot in a studio by actual photographers. And one of the elements of this apparently looking too good is people thinking that it would be difficult to damn near impossible to take photographs with a camera that didn't have a viewfinder whilst they were wearing a bulky spacesuit and had thick gloves on. Then, just a few weeks ago, I published this video trying to address those claims by looking at the Apollo 11 photographs from the lunar surface, as well as going over how the astronauts were able to operate the camera, the training they went through, and how taking photographs like that in reality wouldn't actually be that difficult. However, there were still comments on that video from people seemingly not convinced that it would be possible. So, in this video, I'm going to cover the test that I did several months ago to see just how difficult it was. Now, obviously, it's not an exact replication, uh, given that I didn't need to wear a full spacesuit to be able to breathe, but I tried to get the setup as close as possible. Now, the typical consumer version of the Hasselblad camera that was used during Apollo had a viewfinder on the top of the camera, which you would need to then look straight down from directly above the camera in order to see, which the astronauts couldn't do because their helmet and suit prevented them from leaning their head that far forward, and the camera was mounted too far forward on their suit, so the version of the camera used on the moon did away with the viewfinder mechanism altogether. Then to aim the camera, they had it mounted to their chest, so they just had to aim their body wherever they were trying to photograph, which some people see as too difficult to do to get the subjects in frame. Some people also say that actually firing the camera would be too difficult because they wouldn't be able to push the shutter button whilst wearing thick gloves. However, this problem was mitigated by not only changing the shutter release button on the camera from a small circular button to a large square one, but also had the inclusion of a pistol grip which linked to the button, so simply squeezing the handle would fire the camera. There's also then people who claim that changing the camera settings would be too difficult, but I'll address those later on. Firstly, let's focus on the process of actually framing and taking a picture. The lens that was used was a 60mm lens, which on a medium format camera gives an angle of view similar to that of a 35mm lens on a full frame camera, which is classed as a wide angle lens. So that actually gives a bit more tolerance when it comes to framing and being able to get a particular subject in view. So for the test, I had my Sony a7 IV full frame camera fitted with a lens that I'd set to as close to a 35 millimeter focal length as I could to give as similar a field of view as possible to that of the Apollo cameras. 
I also attached a shutter release cable, which is just a small grip with a button on it that wires into the camera. So pressing the button would then trigger the camera's shutter in a similar manner to the pistol grip of Apollo. But actually it was more difficult because the button on my camera is much smaller than squeezing an entire pistol grip. Then I also wore three layers of gloves, a base layer glove, a thicker liner glove over the top of that, and then thick ski gloves on top of those to make it as difficult as possible to press the button. I also wore a thick ski mask and a balaclava to block my view of the camera, and I did also make a point whilst I was walking around to avoid looking down at the camera altogether, and I was trying to frame the shots purely based on where I felt my chest was pointing which again is actually more difficult than what Apollo astronauts faced, because you can see in the photos and videos that their helmets and the mounting position of the camera actually meant they could see the top of the camera fairly easily to get a good view of where the thing was pointing. So arguably, I was making things more difficult for myself in some instances than was on Apollo. But anyway, I proceeded to walk around the camp taking photos. Though, you'll have to excuse the audio for this. I was trying to give a running commentary at the time of what I was going to photograph. Unfortunately, the wind rather crippled the camera's microphone. So, having started with a close-up photograph of Mike, who was filming me do this test, I then took a shot of the midnight sun over the camp before walking across to near one of the tents taking a photo of it from a few meters away, then taking another photograph of Mike before I turned my attention to a signpost that was outside the next tent along, which also happened to have a small American flag planted next to it. So I took a close-up shot bending over to get a view of the sign, then I stepped back and crouched down slightly for another shot with more of the flag in view. Then I walked back across where I'd just come, stopping to take a view of the north end of the camp before walking up to the shower block to take a photo of the sign that was on the building up at eye level. So that gave me a mixture of subjects that were low down, subjects higher up, some close and some far away all of which I then proceeded to show on the back of the camera afterwards. And even despite wearing the thick three layers of gloves, I was still able to cycle through the photos using the small buttons on the back of the camera. And whilst the shots aren't perfectly framed, I was able to get everything that I was intending to shoot in view. Flying completely blind, not even being able to see the camera and having had no practice beforehand which is more extreme than the Apollo astronauts, given they had months of practice and could actually see the camera. Which ties us nicely to the last point, adjusting the camera settings. The settings that I used for my shots were a 1 250th of a second shutter speed, aperture of f11 and ISO 100, which is quite similar to the settings that we used on Apollo but I kept my settings equal throughout, whereas the Apollo astronauts would adjust their aperture depending on where the sun was in relation to them. They were instructed to shoot at f11 when the sun was behind them, f8 if it was off to the sides, and f5.6 if they were shooting towards the sun. Because shooting towards the sun, everything would be backlit, so the shaded areas would be incredibly dark and lit only by the small amounts of light reflecting off the surrounding scenery. 
Whereas in Antarctica, the sunlight was being diffused in all directions by the atmosphere, plus there was bright white clouds and snow, which reflected huge amounts of light as well, so everything was evenly lit in pretty much all directions for me. But some people have suggested it would have been too difficult for the astronauts to change the aperture settings, which I will argue is simply not the case. As I covered in the previous video, the lenses had a modification to them in the form of a thumb plate bolted to the aperture ring, which would not only allow them to adjust the aperture easily with just one finger, but the plate was attached at a known position at the end of the aperture scale. So even without being able to see the numbers, you can get the aperture to a known value just by moving the thumb plate to a predetermined position. Of course, the question would be, could they actually see the thumb plate to know where it was? Well, the answer to this seems to be yes. There's footage from during the astronauts' training where you can see them making adjustments to the aperture settings whilst wearing a full spacesuit. But not only that, here are two photos from Apollo 12 that I found quite interesting. These are photos of Pete Conrad and Al Bean, but they were taken from two separate film magazines. One was from Magazine 48 and the other from Magazine 49. So they didn't just pass one camera between them like had been the case with Apollo 11. They had a camera each. And what I found interesting is that these photos were taken at near enough the exact same time. In both photos, you can see the reflections of the astronaut that is taking the photo. So photograph 7071 is of Pete Conrad taken by Al Bean. And photograph 7281 is of Al Bean taken by Pete Conrad. Al Bean took his photo of Pete just a few seconds after Pete had taken his photo. Which thing would be that hot? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. Let's see, we're across that, right? Look over here at me and smile. Okay, hey, get you. You're right to the back crater. There's a lamp right in the background. Look great. There you go. So Pete is still holding the camera handle and he hasn't moved. And you can take the reflection of Pete from Al's visor and flip it, and you can see that it matches the photo that Al took perfectly. So we have two cameras shooting almost simultaneously in completely opposite directions. You can actually do the same the other way around for the other photo, but Al hasn't put his hand on the handle yet, so his stance is a little bit different. Plus, you can even see the lunar module way off in the distance behind Pete, which you know is way off in the distance by how out of focus it is. But regardless, in both of these photos, both astronauts have a camera on their chest, and you can see the reflection of the camera in their visor. So what we can see in the reflection is pretty much what the astronauts would have been able to see of the camera through their helmet. So they could see the top of the camera, they could see the top of the lens. And if we look at a clearer photo of Albine, you can clearly see the thumb plate as well, which in fact, it even seems like you can see the base of the plate too, where it attaches to the lens, which is right where the writing for the aperture settings was. So if they could see the base of the plate, they could also read the aperture markings, which would make getting the correct settings even easier. Though even if they couldn't see the markings, they can quite clearly see where the thumb plate itself was, so could easily judge what aperture setting they were on based purely off where the plate was positioned. Now, I've no doubt there will be certain individuals who try and complain that I've not addressed claims that the camera film couldn't apparently work in a vacuum on the moon, so therefore everything else is seemingly irrelevant. Well, I will be doing a video to address those claims in the coming weeks, but the point of these videos was addressing claims regarding the composition of the photos and how easy or difficult is it to take such photos. Oh, there's, there's Mike. And there's a perfectly composed photo of a tent. There's the sun. And there's Mike again. It's not that hard. So... Yeah, I'm not saying that, you know, that doesn't convince, that doesn't necessarily mean that the moon landing's definitely happened, but composing a shot with a chest mounted camera and big thick gloves on is not impossible. So that's going to be it for this video. 
as always if you enjoyed it and you haven't already done so then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button and hopefully i'll see you in the next video